Welcome everybody. This is our second First Tuesdays. And um, thank you all for joining us. Um, this program, First Tuesdays, is related to a um, volunteer initiative that started when I first joined the Carriage Museum. We have a group of volunteers who are doing research into the history of industry and work life in Amesbury. And since, I guess it was, geez, um, March 2016, we've met every month and had a meeting and talked about research. And we started to think that we would open up our meetings to invite experts and colleagues and scholars who are working on topics that we're interested in. And then we wanted to make that program open to the public. So we meet on Tuesdays. And so we like to call this First Tuesdays because it actually happens the first Tuesday of the month. Um, so in a minute, we'll turn it over to Graham. Uh, we have our next First Tuesday program. It will be on April 6th. And I'm pleased to announce that we'll have Tom Kelleher, who's the Curator of Mechanical Arts at Old Sturbridge Village. He's gonna share some insights into the nature of the economy of a pre-industrial New England village. So this will tie in to the program that we offered at the end of the year last year with the survey team. For people who aren't members or part of the Amesbury Carriage Museum, it's pretty easy to find out about us. You know, our website, amesburycarriagemuseum.org. So check us out. Um, I guess I'm also happy to say that because you signed up for this program, we're going to enroll your name in our e-newsletter. Um, no fear, it's easy to unsubscribe, <laughs> but I hope you don't, because I think you'll see we send these out weekly and we try to vary the content and offer a lot for, you know, our, uh, people who are involved in our program. And then if you happen not to be a member, I know we have a number of people who are members. This is our membership drive month. So, you know, if you like what you see, join us. Membership starts at $25 and we'd love to have you part of our, our, our group. And I, I'm gonna say uh, the same thing for Lowell's Boat Shop. You know, we're collaborating with Graham and Lowell's Boat Shop and it's a thrill to be able to do that. We've done it a couple of times in the past and I hope this is the beginning of great things in the future. So just like the Amesbury Carriage Museum, Lowell's Boat Shop has a very <clears throat> easy website and like the Carriage Museum, they're a membership organization as well. You know, so check them out, um, join and your membership really makes a difference to these um, local nonprofits. And I thank all of you who already are. So um, when we begin our program, we're gonna have everyone mute their mics so that, and then we're gonna just spotlight Graham and then me. Um, we are gonna invite questions. We'll take them by, via chat. And if there are people who are new to Zoom, and it's hard to believe that that might be the case, at the bottom of your screen, you can hover there and you'll see a little chat button. And all you do is click on that and you can type your question. And we'll, we'll try to answer them. I think there is a chance because we're expecting a large group that we may not be able to get to them all, but you can reach out to either Graham <clears throat> or myself and we'll do everything we can to answer your questions. We want you to be happy. And I, I do like for this to be conversational. So if, yep. if I'm on a particular slide and you have a question, uh, reach right out. Yeah, that's perfect. And, and um, we're gonna try to end the program by eight, but what that means is we're gonna try and finish up with Graham's presentation with enough time so we could take questions by chat or even live, which I think is even more fun. Um, so the other thing, just because I love being on Zoom calls, we'll end our program at eight, but then we're gonna take a little break and there's a few members who the, the survey group are gonna linger and we're gonna continue our meeting. And if you are bold and willing, I'll invite you to do the same. And that's even more conversational and um, gets 
really deep into the weeds. It's a lot of fun. So there you go. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoy the program <clears throat> and help me welcome our speaker, Graham McKay. We all know Graham as the master boat builder at Lowell's Boat Shop, the executive director and my good colleague. And we invited Graham to speak because Lowell's Boat Shop is actually part of Amesbury's industrial landscape. And the making of these dories is something that's very much an industrial process. And we want to know about the people who are behind the shop and what's going on at Lowell's Boat Shop. So Graham, I welcome you. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, John. And uh, I, see, I see a lot of usual suspects up here in the, in the crowd, which is great. Um, but they do know that I have a tendency to drone on. So I hope your eight o'clock hard out is not uh, <laughs> is not too tight. So um, here, well, why don't we do this and this and this. Um, so John asked me to talk about, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it was off the top of his head or if it was directed, but um, he asked me to talk about Ralph Lowell in the building of a Lowell Dory. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that he did because uh, it's, it's my tendency anyway, as a museum person, I guess I have to call myself that, uh, to, to wanna look at the things that are in the, in the way distant past. And that's because that's what we have typically the least information about. Uh, in this case, I, I haven't spent too much time studying Ralph Lowell, um, I never, I wouldn't say, I, I probably saw him once or twice. Uh, he died in 1995 when I was, uh, I don't know, a, a sophomore in high school, I guess. So I didn't have occasion to meet him. Uh, I would suspect that many of you out there on this Zoom call had that opportunity. Uh, and so not only is this an opportunity for me to talk to you about Ralph, but potentially a chance for you to share uh, Ralph stories with us because it is that history that we are trying to collect. And um, as much as you may think we have it all, there's a lot that is just in story that we don't necessarily have. So um, I, do, I do appreciate this opportunity to take a, take a look at Ralph. Awesome. Um, so Ralph was the seventh generation of Lowell's uh, and the final generation of Lowell's to own the shop. So uh, this is this is the the greatest conglomeration of Lowell's we have in a single photo. Um, you've got old Hiram, as uh, as John Boy Noon likes to call him, Hiram and Firem. <laughs> and then you've got uh, Fred A, and then Fred E there on the left, um, also known as Tinky, and then Walter Lowell down there is the young boy. Walter Lowell is actually Ralph's father. Um, and Walter had a pretty short stint at the boat shop. And so Walter, born in 1891, died in 1933 um, at the age, what is that? That's gotta be uh, 42, right? Yep. Um, so he, he worked at the boat shop between World War I and the Great Depression. He went to MIT, so he had high hopes, just like, uh, just like me maybe. And then, uh, but then he died of diphtheria in the 30s. And Fred, he, he didn't live long enough for Fred A or Tinky to pass the shop down to him. Um, and so eventually Fred A had to pass it down to Ralph in 1942 when Ralph was only uh, 22 years old. Wow. Um, and that's Tinky there. And, and uh, Tinky was known as a hard driver. So he brought the shop really to its preeminence um, of production. And it was said that there was no talking, no laughing, no sharing stories. It was all business. And uh, the guys would, would sort of do a, a work slowdown in retaliation when Tinky had to go answer the mail every day. Uh, but but he, he kept them working hard in, into, you know, you worked a nine hour day no matter if there were seven hours of daylight or 14 hours of daylight. Um, and he, he brought uh, electrical power to the shop. 
um, and and really tried to update it and try to keep it a an industrial space, I guess, John. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the earliest picture that we have of Ralph. I have wow. to presume he's about six or seven years old here, um, sending sending dories off on the train in uh, downtown Amesbury. This is that spur line there that runs through the on the rail trail now. Yep. Um, and I think this is one of my favorite photos in this collection. And not only does it show a whole mess of dories on a train, but um, you know, that it shows young Ralph sitting there with his, his little hat and his boots, um, you know, watching the train leave. It's, it's the boy that, well, I wanna say the boy I wanted to be, but it's probably the boy that I was. Hmm. Um, so, this is some of this stuff comes from uh, a, a Yankee magazine article. And, and I guess I should at this point say that we're very fortunate recently to some of you are probably familiar with Peter Gibb, who was a boat builder at the shop from, geez, he must have been there from the late 70s, um, really up until the early 2000s. And um, he had a chance to work with some of the old timers, but he also, saw the shop through uh, its, I guess, conversion into a, a working museum. But he himself had a fantastic collection of photographs and articles and things that he had collected over the years. Um, and we were just able to get that back into the shop. So uh, again, great to have a chance to look at Ralph because it, I guess it was a motivation for me to start to go through uh, these piles of things that uh, Peter Gibb had. So uh, in that, I found this, this Yankee Magazine article from 1961 uh, that talks about, you know, Ralph is, is speaking to the, I guess, the, the person writing the article, um, but he used to have to bu uh, lug buckets from his great grandfather's place across the street, um, which was Hiram's house, right? And uh, that's the house directly across the street from Lowell's, which was uh, part of the property when they originally bought the property. Wow. Um, and hey, I can Ralph, attest to this, yes. There was a question that I think was in response to the photograph that you showed of the dories on the rail, rail carts. Mm -hmm. And maybe yep. you'll get to that a little bit later, but they're wondering, you know, where are these going? Who's buying so many dories? What, what, you know, tell it, will you get to a little bit more about production and who the market um, I, was? Um, yes, to some degree, but this is, this is a good time to talk about this. So uh, on the train, they were really going uh, nationwide, but even, even worldwide. Uh, I know that, and I don't know if this is that order, um, but there was a, an order of 40 or 50 dories that needed to go to Africa. Uh, I don't know what for, but really the, the thing, you think about this as a fishing boat, um, you think about it as a, something that's very New England-y, but the reality is this was a production boat that you could buy essentially off the shelf. So, and it was cheap. So if you were, uh, if you were in Africa and you needed a whole bunch of boats, you know, for a construction project or whatever in the, in the twenties or thirties, you could buy pretty inexpensively um, a bunch of Lowell's dories. Uh, these also, especially at this time, were headed to the West coast in great numbers um, for, they were used uh, as lifeguards on the beaches out there. And um, this is a little too early, but the, the shop made uh, scores of these for the Coast Guard and the Navy as well um, over the years. And wow. so these could be going anywhere. They could even be going to uh, just to Gloucester because the, the Lowell's maintained a, a warehouse in Gloucester as well oh, that wow. they would keep stock so that the okay. fishing schooners could just you know swing by and, and buy a dozen on their way out. Hmm. So, um, wow. Uh, the, the real answer is they could be going anywhere. And one of the things that actually ended up hurting business was uh, a few things. 
rel- related to the railroad. The, the railroad eventually disappeared the spur line from Amesbury, but um, the B&M Railroad ceased doing uh, small small shipments. So you couldn't you could do less than a less than a carload. And so you mm-hmm. couldn't just send one dory from here to Kennebunkport mm-hmm. um, or something like that. And that that was tough on business. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, Ralph's Ralph's early years, uh, he started as a as a young lad in the paint room, uh, basically doing the, the crap jobs before he got a chance to do the, the better ones. Um, but it seemed that he was fetching a lot of water. I assume for the men to drink, but I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem uh, too useful if it's frozen solid all day. And I, I put this in the other day as I was freezing in the shop, um, looking at the, the, well, trying to get the Keurig to work <laughs> that was frozen solid, wow. uh, mm-hmm. had it next to the wood stove. So uh, these days have not changed. And I'm actually, I'm quite happy that they have not changed because um, I think that would take away some of the history, some of the history and some of the ambiance. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when Ralph was 15, they had the the great flood, the flood of 36. Oh, right. Um, and so his <laughs> his uh, grandfather Tinky said, "Don't don't bother moving any boats because the shop's never flooded in its history." Um, and that's what I tell right flood insurance every year when I give them. <laughs> three thousand dollars for the premium uh-huh. um anyway it kept rising and rising and uh and what eventually happened was that that flood blew out all the, the windows on the river level of the shop wow and they rebuilt them in their current their current state uh-huh. um if i finish early enough which is unlikely i can show you pictures of um the shop prior to that but there were big doors on the river end where you could take boats from the lower level of the paint room and push them right into the river. Mm. Um, but the river at that time too, in 1936, uh, was far less clean than it is now. And so you can see it brought all kinds of horrible things, creosote into the shop. Um, and I have to imagine that a lot of that is still there. Mm. Um, wow. And I and that a lot of times people ask me what the shoots are on the river side of the shop. There in the middle shop, there are these two shoots that go out. And those are actually at floor level. And they were, you could sweep the floor right up the chute, right into the river. Um, that's one, one of these things, Ralph. The sawdust was dumped in the river in the summertime and saved for burning in the wood stove in the winter. Um, again, we, we just in the last year um, have a fully functioning fire suppression system for the first time. And it is a miracle that, uh, that yeah. the place is still standing. Right. Right. So this is said to be Ralph. Uh, and again, said to be all you can really know is what's uh, written on the back of the photograph. But um, it's at least a, a nice looking young lad in a nice Amesbury skiff, which is what that boat is, mm-hmm. um, holding a nice fish. So um, I think Ralph, like a lot of us who grew up along the river, um, was a river rat. And it, it seems that he knew or was learning hard work as a young boy, uh, you know, basically from the from the earliest days, especially from uh, from Tinky, who was known as a hard driver. But he got a little bit of a reprieve uh, when he got drafted, <laughs> and had to go into the uh, into the military. So uh, one of our board members actually just found this for me the other day, again because I haven't had much occasion to look at Ralph Lowell. And wow. It's interesting to see that he had lived at 466 Main Street, um, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, but apparently at some point had moved to, to Purchase Street in Newburyport. Hmm. Um, and you can see his employer is Hiram Mullen's son down there at the bottom. Um, and he did end up in the Navy. Oh, uh, And that's 466 Main Street right there. So if you, if you look, obviously here's the boat shop. Um, this is great grandfather's house. Uh, it's either this one or this one. I can't recall. Um, and then down here. So the Lowell's owned at one time. If you look at the old maps, all of these houses all the way along here. Um, and this is this is the shop prior to 
1940s when these two buildings were demolished in the, the current. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is actually prior to 1936 because you can see the windows, oh. the river level windows haven't been built in their current mm -hmm. way. So, um, hey, Graham, before yes. you, um, one of our survey members who, um, you know, has no mercy for the fish says it looks like he was holding a salmon. Do you know what kind of fish that was that Ralph had caught in that photograph? Uh, well, cons <laughs> considering all I know about the photograph is it says Ralph Lowell question mark on the back. <laughs> uh i don't i'm not i'm not an ichthyologist but you can it does look like a nice i don't know where ralph would have found a salmon yeah all right not in the not in the merrimack river okay yeah. uh this shop right here is actually this is uh pert lowell and company if anyone knows pert lowell they're over at newbury now um and if someone wants to know an interesting origin story on pert lowell ask me at the end um because i'll probably mm. come up against time um, and we don't have, interestingly enough, we don't have a whole lot of photos of the shop, of the interior of the shop, um, you know, really until maybe until the 80s. Mm. Um, so this is, this is one of the rare uh, shots of the crew. Um, here's Ralph. Well, mm -hmm. maybe I can tell you, but also I'm going to see if this will work. Bear with me. This is Ralph's brother, Fred Lowell, wow. um, who lives down the street. And I had him in the shop one day and I couldn't help but ask him if he could tell me who the hell these guys were. Uh, sound. Can you hear it? No. Can't hear it. Hold yeah. on. I like the idea. Oh man. It's awesome. Let's see. Well, anyway, so there's Aubrey Marshall there. Oh, wow. Um, this is Fred, who was telling me who the guys were in the photo. There's Ralph. Um, That's great. This guy, this guy, I guess, had a fast car, he said. <laughs> and there were, um, I can send anyone that video or maybe post it on the, on the website. Mm -hmm. But, and then there's Buddy, the dog, and, uh, Buddy was a victim of Main Street oh. and automobiles, unfortunately. Um, but interesting in the shop, you can see there's a boat underway. These are these are easels, which I'll get to a little bit later mm -hmm. uh, in the program here. But um, just a really, a really great photograph of the guys. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen or so guys. The the shop, even in its heyday didn't employ really any more than 15 or 20 guys at any one time. Hmm. Um, and so Ralph was faced when he came back from the war, uh, was faced with a changing marketplace. Uh, you had a bunch of GIs who wanted to recreate. The, the fisheries had mechanized and so didn't really need dories anymore. And um, what he did was we're going to use the COVID word of the year. He pivoted <laughs> and uh, and started to produce recreational craft. This is not a boat that I would think Lowell's Boat Shop ever produced, but here it is in a photo, and uh, I've seen it in a catalog as well. And again, this this comes from the the Peter Gibb collection. So this here is where our current paint room now stands. From about you can this light pole. If any of you have probably most likely been to the yep. shop for the holiday open house you enter right there mm -hmm. here's our paint room to about there and then this is now a big a big gully with a shallop in it um, and this was all lumber and boat storage over on this side and these these were for catalog photos that uh, ralph was taking to try to build business um, and this was called the the lowell fisherman mm. um, it did it did up it did 12 knots Wow. Hold your hat. Uh, this <laughs> is Arthur True's over here, Arthur True's boat shop. Oh, um, wow. And he was doing the same thing. Uh, wow. He was at this time, again, he was pivoting to do uh, recreational craft as well. 
Uh, and it was said, I, I saw in some of these old notes, that door, there's no floor in there. That went right in and down. So you could throw lumber in and stack it uh, two stories high in there and pull wow. from the top of the pile here or pull from the bottom of the pile uh, at the basement of this building. Hmm. Cool. And I say he was pivoting. Uh, this is a far cry from Dory. Um, and again, this is a photo I had not seen until uh, I saw the photos from, from Peter Gibb. And there's, there's Ralph. I don't know who this stately gentleman is, but they're, they're sitting in this, uh, this little yacht of a thing, little motorboat. Um, and this was a variation of uh, an Amesbury power skiff, uh, very involved with an inboard. And in I have a photograph of five or six of these boats all lined up um, inside the shop. A very odd, um, but interesting evolution in our, in our history. And there, there it is underway. It's a different, more basic version. So, um, you know, the, the shop was, was a manufacturer. And so they were, they were out or they were manufacturing boats, I guess, Palmer engines outsourced the building of these boats to Lowell's. So we would build the hull and then we'd send it down to Connecticut to the Palmer company and they'd put an engine in it. And then it would be sold as a, a Palmer fishing dory. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you know, today it's all very custom. You, you want X, Y, and Z. Then it was, uh, hey guys, we're gonna build 20 of these things, you know, get to work. And, and I don't wanna say there wasn't anything special about it, but um, there wasn't really a, a focus on craft necessarily. It was, all the boats were made from wood and you knew how to build a boat. And so you just went to work and, and built a boat. Yep. That's great. Um, and then as the, you know, as the decade, another decade, the century wore on, I guess. Um, so Ralph, Ralph had his job cut out for him to find business. Um, and that is to say, you know, in the fifties here, they're probably still building maybe a hundred to 200 boats a year. Um, which is, you know, 10% of what their production had been uh, 50 years or 40 years even mm -hmm. before. So a huge decline in the, in the market. And, uh, and they were still able to, to make money and, and pay everybody. But uh, I don't know that he was bringing home the cheese that Hiram and, uh, and Tinky were bringing home. Uh, and the, the shop, you know, suffered physically i think for it but here you see a couple of dories uh these were known as punts and these were typically uh made for like boys and girl scout camps and things like that um, in the mid 50s mm -hmm. uh, and when i say you know the shop suffered for it this is again part of that yankee magazine thing um it's just interesting to see obviously some disrepair over here. Uh, the shop is in want to paint. Um, right. And this, this again too, Ralph built this when he came back from the war uh, as an office. So he built the, act, the, the present day paint room as a showroom and he built this as an office. And, and this was really what kept business alive uh, through, really through the middle part of the 20th century where uh, scout camps and so they made all these skiffs um, for boys and girl scout camps which of which there were I mean I have no idea but um, sure I lots. think there were lots right. um, and and you know one of these skiffs might last eight or ten years but the 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 churn in that was enough to keep the the shop busy um, basically throughout the the whole middle part of the 20th century um, and then you get to to this period, and this this must have been really difficult. And I really wish that I had the opportunity to talk to Ralph about this because you know he is in basically almost two hundred years of business, and he gets to the point where he's going to sell the shop, 
and business must have been horrible enough to let that happen. Um, or maybe it was getting hard to find labor. Uh, maybe it was getting to be too much to manage. I don't know. But in 1975-76, uh, Ralph sold the shop to the Odells. Here, Jim Odell in front of the shop about that time. And uh, you can see it needs, needs a little bit of help. Um, here is Ralph Lowell building boats up at uh, Strawberry Bank up in Portsmouth. Right. with Aubrey Marshall. So what happened was the Odell's bought the business from Ralph uh and then Ralph sold or gave or whatever all of the contents meaning uh the the benches, the tools, the patterns, all that stuff to Strawberry Bank. So when the Odell's came, I think they they walked in and there was Fred Tarbox in a chair with a pipe saying, uh, you know, what do you want to do? And Ralph went up to Strawberry Bank with all this stuff and started to build boats and compete with the Odell's hmm. in, in the late seventies and in the early eighties, um, <laughs> which was an interesting back yeah. and forth. And I, I don't, I, I can't imagine that that relationship was, uh, wasn't right. anything but frosty after right. that. Um, but Ralph went up there and was doing it, and he took Aubrey Marshall again, who had been working at the boat shop since 1923, uh, mm -hmm. and and who was left behind was Fred Tarbox, who uh, had I believe learned from Aubrey Marshall, but had been there for not since 1923, but uh, I think certainly since before bombs were falling on Pearl Harbor, um, and and he was the connection that allowed the Odell's to continue building, building boats there. Uh, here's Ralph and there's Jim Odell uh, in the shop. I have to imagine sometime in the mid eighties. Um, and I think, I think things got patched up. Uh, and again, this is, I'm pasting this together from things that I either know or think I know. But uh, either Strawberry Bank got tired of Ralph or Ralph didn't show up. And anyway, it didn't work out up there. And he started to come back around at Lowell's. But uh, none of the patterns or nothing was there to, to build with. And so um, I've got a lot of correspondence with Jim Modell and Ralph to Strawberry Bank trying to get access to the patterns to trace them so that they can use them to build right. boats again at, at Lowell's. Um, and it's just, wow. uh, it's just an interesting, you know, back and forth. But um, anyway, he was, he was a boat builder his entire life and whether he kept the count, I don't know, but um, I'm sure thousands and thousands of boats. Um, but he was also not unlike the rest of his family, uh, he was a busy man. Um, he was the town clerk in Newbury for almost 20 years. Um, and you can, it's a pretty, unfortunately, it seems like a pretty short obituary for mm. someone who did so much. Yeah. Um, and you see, you see, you see here, there's also tell, you see Eleanor Noyes, um, there's tale that because if you if you do the math, uh, you know Ralph got the shop in the early '40s, but then he had to go into the Navy for a year and a half or two years. Mm. Um, and the word is that Eleanor Noyes actually ran the boat shop when he was off uh, off in the Navy, mm. um, and then when he got back, um, he took over again. So, very cool. Um, so that's Ralph again. Uh, there, there are plenty more stories and, um, part of this Peter Gibb collection that we do have, uh, has this huge binder of handwritten notes. Um, and a lot of it is his own interactions with people. So he's got 
he's got stories that Ralph would come into the shop and tell him and he would write them down and put them in this binder. And I, I have yet to have the time to go through that, but uh, I'm sure there are just gold nuggets throughout that that are, you know, the oral history that you just don't know. Somebody uh, acknowledged uh, Ralph was a square dance caller. Graham, have you uh, embraced that? I, heard, I have heard this as well, yes. Yeah. So yeah. have you tried to find some of the square dance tunes? You're ready to put a dance on? Maybe if uh, we're all vaccinated this summer, we'll okay. do a square dance. Okay. I'll tell you what, when the, uh, the shop is now structurally sound, and if we, if we cleaned all those boats out, we'd have a hell of a dance floor. That sounds fun. Um, so now you want to talk about building a dory. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And I can break it down for you uh, as, as quickly and simply as, uh, as I can. Um, this is how they used to do it and how they used to do it. I mean, in, uh, in Tinky's time and Hiram's time when they were mass producing these things and the shop was built as a factory to mass produce these. So originally in the attic, which we now use as lumber storage, they were, uh, cutting out pieces of boats. And again, I don't, uh, I thought I had put this in there, but uh, Ralph was a was a busy boy, and he was a he was a businessman, and he he had a lot of uh, fingers and a lot of pots. And one of the things that I guess they they did when business was slow is they made Adirondack chairs, which were sold at Jordan Marsh, uh, and those are those are made in the attic. Wow. So those patterns are still sitting up there in a box, and <laughs> I've I've moved them a dozen times over the years and been like what the hell are these doing here but now that i've and this was part of part of one of those notes uh, now that i know that that's what the the guys did to keep busy when when work was slow mm. um it's kind of an interesting thing and you know i mean who here <laughs> who here ever shopped at a jordan marsh <laughs> how long has that been gone 30 years 35 years yeah, right. so anyway in the dory days up here uh, the wood storage was in the other ancillary buildings. Um, they would cut out frames and stems and bottoms and all that would happen up here. Um, and then the assembly floor, which is the, the road level, they would take a bottom, they would nail on the frames and the stem and the transom, and give you a skillet, and the boat would come to the middle part of the room where they'd get planked up. And then uh, Toward the back, they get rails and all that kind of stuff. And then they'd head down, and usually down here they'd get um, seats and any extras, uh, and then into the paint room for paint. Uh, and once they'd been painted, they would dry for a day or two, and then get stuck in this uh, building over here to dry further and await shipment out uh, or shipment out. Um, in the early days, Tinky was said to have rode uh, strings of dories to Gloucester. Um, oh. As you saw later on, uh, these went out by, by truck and train, but um, there was a lot of boats leaving this part of the river. Um, and the shops themselves would trade uh, labor and pieces and parts. And so um, what you see here is a dory skillet, which is what this is, um, going, this is the turn in the road right by, uh, I believe uh, Rocky Hill Road is right up there. Yep. And this is coming around to the shop. This is probably French's. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a, a dory skillet either going to Trues or to Lowell's from Trues or, um, you know, somebody had a boat to build and they just, they bought the skillet and wheeled it down the street and planked it up. Um, and that's the way things went in those days. I think, uh, you know, eventually in the, early part of the 20th century, a lot of these pieces and parts were made in the downtown carriage factories um, and then sold to the, the shops on the river um, because you couldn't possibly, you know, Lowell's in 1911 building more than 2000 boats. You can't possibly build seven boats a day um, starting from scratch. You can't physically have that much boat in the shop at one time. Um, and after, you know, 50 dories a week, 
they, they'd be coming out of your ears. So um, there's, they had to have just been getting them out of there as fast as they made them. And that in Lowell's was, was one of a few, right? You've got Arthur True, you've got uh, right. Frank Morals right there. Uh, Andrews, personal Andrews, you know, they're all churning out all these dories. So they're just, they must have just been piling up on Main Street um, every hey, week. Somebody yes. is asking for you to explain the dory skillet. The dory skillet. So uh, let's see if I'll get there. Maybe not. So what you've got here is a dory bottom. So a spider skillet. Oh, okay. A spider, yeah, a spider skillet was a, uh, was a cooking apparatus with legs that you'd have over the campfire. So here you've got your dory bottom with the frames, yep. the stem and the transom. Uh, and if you turned it upside down, it resembled, resembled a, a spider skillet. So um, they, they called that a skillet. And so um, somebody made the bottom and the frames and somebody else is gonna put the planking on. Correct. Yeah, yep. all right. Yep, and these, again, these pieces were we're sitting in piles in everybody's shop. Um, okay. And it could have been, you know, it was probably just as inexpensive to buy the skillet as it was to, yep. to make all this. And if, if you had an order that you had to fill, it was awesome. Somebody had a skillet. Let's go. Um, we found a obituary for David True. Yep. And I think his father had the wood shop that was up Rocky Hill Road. But one of the things in the obituary I talked about was making the knees that were then given to the dory shops for making yes. the boats. So, it, you know, that ties into your narrative that, you know, many shops were making parts and they were circulating between the boat shops themselves. What year? Was that pre-1880 or so? Yeah, it was around that time. I'll find the obituary and I can copy it for you. Yeah, so up um, if you go up Rocky Hill Road, just before you get to the Irving Station, there's a you go over a little creek, mm -hmm. and if you look right, there's a house there now, um, but just to the right of the house is this big berm, uh, which uh -huh. I presume was the the dam for the mill pond, which okay. backed up under where Stop and Shop parking lot is basically. Yeah, yeah, and that was where True's uh, planing sawmill and planing mill was and they mm -hmm. they furnished a lot of the wood for the the shops mm -hmm. um so you can see ralph had a lot of uh competition um interesting here you see this powwow craft at cedar yeah. street um but uh again there were a lot of shops doing the same thing right and so um mass production was was the way of it as as was sharing of you know quote unquote technology and resources um so then we get to 19 1980 when we the lowells have sold it and now we're starting to build custom boats for people and so that was how they did it then with uh, and I'll get into to how they did it then with patterns um, and a few notes and things um, to how we do it today. But it, it somewhat comes down to that break in the chain where all the contents of the shop went up to Strawberry Bank and the Odell's had to uh, recreate it basically out of, out of nothing. And so um, a lot of that came from Fred Tarbox's memory, mm -hmm. but um, it is how we do it today um, because that's what's survived from the Odell era. So when I go to build a boat today, I have one of these to look at. And this tells me uh, what I'm doing. So uh, just like in the old days, it starts with a bottom. They would have had a pattern and we do have some patterns for some of these bottoms. Um, but in the absence of that, you have this right here, which tells me that my bottom is 13 feet long. It's 30 inches wide. You can see the 15 there. So that's that's half of the bottom, right? All right. Um, and you've got five timbers that are 26 inches apart. So you've got 26 inches 
and then you come out seven and three quarters. And then you go 26 inches and you come out 13 and a quarter and you go 26 inches and you come out 15, blah, 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 all the way down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get a series of points. You take a batten and you bend a nice curve around it. And there's your bottom right there. I can't see because I'm doing the screen share, but uh, what does that say up there? What am I building? It looks like a surf door to me. Yep. Can you see? Yep, surf door. Um, so then now you've got your bottom. Uh, you've got to put a stem on it. It says big dory. Okay, so you go over to the stem pile, the stem patterns, and you find the one that says big dory. Um, and trace that, inch and seven eighths oak. And there's your, there's your stem pattern. So now your timbers, there's five of them. They're gonna be 18 foot swamp. So you're gonna to go to the, the pile of patterns for the timbers and you're gonna find 18 foot swamp. And you're gonna do five of those. You've got a four, a four middle, a middle, an aft, middle, and an aft one. And then your transom is roughly 47 inches long. Uh, and it's 14 inches wide, 41 inches up from the bottom because it's a triangle, right? Mm. So it's all basically there. Uh, now your rocker. So this is the bottom isn't flat for and aft. It's actually higher forward and higher at the stern than it is in the middle. So you have to bend that into the bottom. Um, so once you, once you get this all together, you bend it down with this rocker to the building bed that we have in the shop. Um, brace it all around so it can't move. And then you get to planking. So this is uh, the most genius and simplified means of doing it. You, you have a plank, you wrap it around the boat, you measure up from the bottom 10 inches at the bow, five inches in the middle part of the boat, nine inches at the stern, oh, cool. take, a, take a batten, make a nice pretty line, you're done. Go mm -hmm. to the next plank, you put that on, you trace the one before it, and you come up these heights, make a line and you're done. So on and so forth, um, up to the rail and up to the rowing seat. So there's a lot of information here with also a lot of gaps that you have to fill in either mm -hmm. with experience um, or your best guess. And I was dubious of these when I started, but as they have yet to turn out uh, an ugly boat, but then you come across things like this where things are X'd out uh, sometimes you see like red pen through something with a question mark and there's no explanation like this. This is a classic one right here, right? Yeah. And you're <laughs> so right. you're, you're left to, to wonder what am I supposed to do? Um, sorry. Uh, and so if and this is where I wish I had Fred or Ralph or Aubrey Marshall to ask, you know, mm. what do you do here? Um, and they would probably just say, ah, eh, just, you know, put it on until it looks right and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there are these things, uh, and this is actually kind of gold because, you know, bank stories themselves are the bread and butter of the shop and pretty simple, but uh, we don't have, because of that, we don't have a lot of information on them because uh, they were largely built with uh, patterns and little little personal patterns that the boat builders themselves would have. Um, and in some of the old advertising, you see double dories, haddock dories, things like that, blue, blue fish dories. Um, and you don't really know what that means. Uh, and this adds, this gives you a little bit of an insight into, into what they're talking about. But um, Very cool. this, this gives you a lot of what you need to know for, for the dory bottom part anyway. And uh, in the case of a bank story, the rest of it is is the same essentially. So you you alter the the size and shape of the bottom, but everything on top is essentially the same, mm -hmm. no matter the size. And here's our Go ahead. Go ahead. yes. Um, so it's seven fifty, and I do want to leave some time for questions. I know I we can, talked I about. I can power not... through in five. Okay, all right. And then, you know what we could do, Graham, if you want to linger and join the group of others after the, the program is done, you know, we can offer more time for questions, but, you know, let's just respect people who want to be sure. done at eight and then we can improvise the, the rest. Yep. 
This okay. is awesome, though. It's really fun hearing you talk about it. Um, so here's a here's a couple of other um, things, and and the interesting thing here is you, know, you get the actual angles of certain parts of the boats drawn on the page. Mm. So you don't need any numbers or anything. You just take your your bevel gauge right to the page um, to achieve some of these angles. That's great. Um, but you can see generally they're all kind of the same. So prior to this, what they would have is a stick, a dory stick, and it had all your measurements right on it, all of these measurements and all of those wow. measurements. So uh -huh. you could take this one little stick wow. and achieve a boat. Um, and this is, I drew this of a dory. Now nah, we'll skip over that. This is just the planking process. Um, but basically this is, a, you know, your traditional boat plan, right? Where this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what we work from, which is all this same information, very much simplified. And this is what the old timers would work from, That's great. which is all of that information, um, even more simplified. And we do have a pile of these in the shop as well. Um, but it's missing that little bit of experience, um, to turn them into something like this, it's beautiful. which is your, your finished product. Yeah. Um, and then what do we do today? So, so that's, we still build pretty fancy boats for customers. Um, I would say we are 50% museum, 50% boat shop and 50% educational institution. <laughs> and so, uh, here we are with our apprentices we do we have an apprentice program which is i think the best way of passing along uh these skills to the younger generation um, and they get to work on cool projects like this is if you've not been by the shop and seen our the shallop from plymouth plantation um hurry up it's going to go in the water at the end of april um but we we teach apprentices on cool projects to achieve um well i guess to to do work for organizations like ours that that want these boats but don't have the means themselves to work on them um, and so we can accomplish that uh while at the same time teaching kids how to do it which is a, a pretty unique little That's niche awesome. so this winter will be uh the next winter i guess we'll be building uh some life-saving dories with trape academy and kittery for the Wood Island Life Saving Station oh, wow. um, in Portsmouth Harbor. Very cool. So another program using apprentice help yeah. to, to make boats that an organization needs. There you go, John. You are awesome. I Graham. hit, I hit the post, I hit the post. You did, high five for you, Graham. Hey, that was really wonderful. I, you know, I appreciate the shop even more. Um, so, Let's so open up. If there's any questions, you can type them in the chat. I'll get you started. Pam, well, I'll just unmute better. everybody. Okay. Well, can we do that, Meryl? Do you know yeah. how to do it? Yeah, we'll Meryl just shout there. over. Hi, Heidi. Hi. Um, Hi people Hi, have to unmute themselves. Okay. And Graham, oh, if you, you can take your um, image off, we can go back to seeing everybody. Yay. How's that? That's awesome. So, um, Pam, you have a question. You want to ask your question, Pam? Um, yes. Um, when you didn't have any patterns to go from, did you um, try to search out and purchase some old dories that might have been built earlier uh, and then make patterns from those? Uh, that was before my time, so I, I, I don't know, but I... I'm told that Fred Tarbox drew some patterns from memory, um, but I have to also presume that there were enough of these boats around that they could have just done that. And I, I would assume that they did. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's an easy enough thing to do. I've got a, a guy came into the shop as I was leaving tonight actually with, um, there was a guy in Seabrook named Butler who made Amesbury skiffs of a sort a little bit different and he's got some um and i can take that boat make patterns from it take all make one of those sheets that i showed you um in in about an hour and be able to build that boat in the future so um 
that'll probably happen this this summer but i have to presume that um the odell's had to get creative like that to, to build some boats they also could came I, up with some some newer designs some different designs could i could i say something about that oh is that ed ed yeah oh ed you you talk all day you know much more about this than i do. well i'm not too sure how much i know about it but when jim bought the shop he was in the process of actually buying it and uh we were up at strawberry bank susan and i and I forget who else, just going through Strawberry Bank, and we saw all this stuff about Lowell's Boat Shop. It was now, and we said, wait a minute. That's right. So we went back to the lawyer and said, hey, they got a we got a problem here. And I think that it was settled somehow because the relationship between Jim and Ralph, as you know, it, it continued right on through. Uh, and I didn't see any great recriminations. So it was somehow resolved. Hmm. I, I wasn't involved in it on a daily basis. It was a weekend thing with me yeah. at that time. Well, again, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was barely breached at that point. So I don't, uh, right. Right. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But it was a bit of a surprise. But, but Ed, but what? those are the things, those are the things, those are the histories that if you put down either written or, I mean, you know, talk to your phone for, for a half an hour. Um, you know, those are the things that we need to get now. Okay. I'll get together with Susan um, and Mac and, if, and George and we'll talk about it. But listening to this, I mean, I, I am currently the authority other than you. Yeah. And, and this is what I know. So, yeah. you know, I, I would love to know more. Sure. No, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Susan and to, uh, to uh, Mac and George and the, yeah. uh, so well, we can't Peter do anything Gibbs, else, right? Right. The Peter Gibbs stuff must be great because Peter was there for a long time. Yeah. A graduate of Brown University working there. And uh, a lot of uh, smarties. But there's a lot of stuff there that I have, a lot of photos that I have not yeah. seen. There's a lot of great stuff. So, yeah, that's great. I'm very excited. Hey, um, there was one more question that came in and somebody was wondering about uh, painting the dories. Was yeah. that an option or did it just come in a standard color and that's what you got? Uh, the dories themselves came in a standard color. So uh, traditionally it was uh, a white lead based paint that they, they would make right there in the shop. Right. And the, the coloring was a, it, they traditionally they were salmon with a green rail and the salmon color was uh, brick dust mixed in. They would buy, Oh uh, wow! The broken, the broken bricks from um, cool. um, uh, Mr. Hoyt. What's the what's the name? Patton's uh, Patton's Brickyard right there down in the hollow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would crush them up and make fine wow. dust, and they would mix that into the paint. Oh, that'd be um, ah. And then uh, in the basically after World War One, I, I think then they. They started to buy commercial paints, and mm. uh, and the boats started to come in different different colors. That be Cabot. What's that? Cabot paints. No, uh, a lot of it was Gloucester Sea Jacket, and they actually made uh, a paint color called Lowell Green. That was because um, the Lowells had some color of like sea foam green that was very popular, and so the paint company actually started to produce it. And they called it low green. You might want to mention, Graham, for those people who weren't. No, I lost it. OSHA. Hmm. Did I just hear you say OSHA? Oh, I don't I never want to hear that word. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, so it's eight o'clock. I'm going to say thank you, Graham, for an awesome program. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I think we gave the information on how you can learn about the Carriage Museum, how you can learn about Lowell's Thanks. Boat Shop. Encourage every one of you to support both organizations by being a member, just keeping involved. It's great.